As you can imagine from this channel, one of the things I'm enjoying about the Warhammer Plus subscription is The Vault, an archive of uploaded content from old editions of Games Workshop games. And recently an interesting book hit The Vault, The Taros Campaign. What's that, you might ask? Well, it's an important little segment of 40k background, originally invented by Forge World as a bit of an experiment in how the Imperial Armor series would work and recently used again as the background for Aeronautica Imperialis. So in this video, I'm gonna explain what it is and take you through the entire story, hopefully in about 25 minutes. So the Taros campaign first appeared as the subject for Imperial Armor Volume 3, released by Forge World in October 2005 as the third in their Imperial Armor series. Well, not really the third. Forge World have been creating niche collector's edition vehicle models for Warhammer 40k since the late 90s, and over time they've released a number of books called Imperial Armor, from the very early ones, which Snipe and Wib actually went into in this video, to various slim update documents, and at the time, the most recent were these two. Imperial Armor Volume 1, Imperial Guard and Imperial Navy, and Imperial Armor Volume 2, Space Marines and Forces of the Inquisition. These were big hardback books that were little more than lists of units with technical drawings, background info on that particular tank, and diagrams. The Taros campaign was a little bit different though. Imperial Armor Volume 3 was a campaign book, written by Warwick Kim Raid and Tony Cottrell and detailing just one big campaign, in this case the war between the Imperium and the Tau on the desert world of Taros, and as well as featuring existing Imperial Armor kits, new kits would be released to support it, in particular a range of new Tau vehicles, emplacements and battle suits. As well as rules for those units, the book provided historical background, sample missions, and a campaign system, much of which is available in the Warhammer Vault. This became the standard format for Imperial Armor books for the next decade, providing a lot more structure to the release schedule compared to how Forge World functioned before. And since those books carried on from 4th edition to 7th edition, eventually Forge World started releasing updated versions. A second edition of the Taros campaign was released in 2013. So, let's find out how the campaign unfolds. <laughs> Like everything in 40k, the story of Taros actually starts somewhere completely different, with Abaddon the Despoiler's 13th Black Crusade. The second time this was prominent in the background. It's kind of been about to happen or happening since the late 90s. Anyway, to help the war effort, the Forge world of Stygis 8 is asked to increase production, and in order to do this, more raw materials need to be sourced. The Departmento Munitorum's suggestion is the planet of Taros, a small mining world with a desert climate that, according to an audit from M38, possessed vast mineral wealth. In order to ascertain if this is current, the Departmento Munitorum sent a delegation led by Auditor Prime Nymus Dree, which lands at the capital, Tarakeen, and meets with the planetary governor, a man called Lord Orlis. The initial meeting and ceremonies go fine, and on the face of it, the initial M38 audit seems all correct, but as Auditor Prime Dree starts to tour the mines, inconsistencies emerge. It was not until Auditor Prime Dree started to visit the outlying mine sites that he started to wonder about certain aspects of the mining operation on Taros. Firstly, there were many abandoned mining sites scarring the deserts, evidence of much activity. Each time he was told that a load or ore stream had been mined out and the operation had moved on. To the mine owners, this was evidence of industrious hard work, but to an auditor, it was the physical evidence that the planet's estimated reserves were being eaten into. So, where had the spare ore gone? It had evidently been mined and then disappeared. Everyone on the planet, Lord Orlis, the mine owners, and the trading syndicates, all claimed ignorance. However, unknown to the Imperials, the Tau had long had an interest in Taros. Its position near Tau space, its desert climate, and its mineral wealth made it a prime target for expansion. But it was an Imperial world, and the Tau knew how warlike the Imperium could be, so instead of taking it by force, they elected to dispatch a team of water-cast diplomats to initiate trade with the humans. This illicit trade between the Tau and the Tarosians had begun two decades before, and for the ten years before the audit, Tau Earthcast had started helping to identify and extract more ore using advanced Tau technology. The Departmento Munitorum visit had thrown Lord Orlis and the mine owners into a panic which they barely concealed from Dree, but it was something off-world that would alert the Departmento to the truth. Nearby, Patrol Group Ravener, led by the Dauntless class light -like cruiser Lord Ravener, was conducting anti-pirate patrols on the edge of the Damocles Gulf. 
They come across and then track three unregistered transports heading to what turns out to be a Tau way station in the Gulf, where they rendezvous with Tau ships. The fleet swept in to engage, and although Tau reinforcements arrived, the patrol managed to capture one Tau transport ship and all three pirate ships, all with empty holds. The humans claim ignorance, however, the last registered stop in their manifest was Taros to collect ore. The news of this is eventually picked up by Order to Prime Dree, who sees this as evidence for the missing ore. It's clear to him that the Tarosians are engaging in trade with Xenos. So, having concluded his report, he then submits all this evidence to the office of the Munitorum, and wheels start to turn. The Administratum considers its options. An assassin would solve the Lord Orlis problem, but they think the Tau need to be sent a message, a show of strength. The decision is made to petition the Astartes for a strike, capture the capital, remove the rulers, replace them, and then remain as a garrison. Requests are immediately sent out to notable chapters, and Captain Armoros of the Avenging Sons responds, his second company boarding the strike cruiser Proxima Justice within days and departing for Taros. The plan is an orbital assault against the Governor's Palace in Tarakeen in an attempt to capture the Governor. Tactical squads operate roadblocks around the complex while assault and terminator squads clear the palace. Of course, this is exactly what the Space Marines specialize in and the attack moves with devastating speed, with the Avenging Sons easily overwhelming the local PDF guarding the palace, but Orlis can't be found. The Suns move to Phase 2, a search and destroy of the entire city, but as they switch objectives, the road-blocking tactical squads come under attack by colossal and completely unexpected Manta dropships deploying full hunter carges into the city. The Space Marines are forced to pull back for a siege of the palace, and while they hold out on the first day against attacking Tau Hammerheads and infiltrating Pathfinder teams, the second day sees even more Tau forces committed, including Barracuda fighters and Tiger Sharks. The Suns deploy their Thunderhawks to try and hold them off, but by the third day, with the Tau holding total air superiority, the 40 remaining Marines are forced to call for evacuation and retreat from the planet. Taros was officially declared Ex Imperium Rebellis, a system in rebellion against the Emperor's divine rule. The sacred Pax Imperialis had been torn up by the planetary governor, Orlis. His actions now made him not just a criminal, but a traitor. The Tau were already on Taros in force and must be ejected. The Master of the Administratum signed a document stating just this, as well as listing the planetary governor's crimes, over 100 in all, mostly punishable by death. The document, called the Taronian Declaration, was a license to action a new, larger attack against the rebel world. Next time, the attack would not be a surgical strike by a single strike force of space marines, it would require the involvement of all those fighting arms of the Imperium willing to commit forces to repel the alien aggression. The invasion of Taros was now in motion. With Taros declared as essential to Stygi's needs, an invasion plan was drawn up. The Administratum appoint Lord High Commander Otto von Gustavus to lead the invasion, with the intention of beginning a deployment within a standard year. That's incredibly fast for the Imperium. The bulk of the ground troops would be dubbed the 4621st Imperial Guard Army, and led by Lord Marshal de Stael, who originally estimated that he'd need 21 regiments to complete the invasion. However, with time against them, this is eventually reduced to 10 regiments, with Stygis promising to supply a Titan Legion to make up the numbers. Of these 10 regiments, 5 were sourced from the desert planet of Talan. The other five were the 23rd Elysian Drop Troops, the Serenian Assault Engineers, a heavy infantry unit with urban experience which was considered useful for the main attack on Tarakeen, the 114th Cadian Shock Troops, a mechanized unit under the command of Colonel Snake Stransky, the 8th Brimlock Dragoons, who had experience against the Tau in the Damocles Gulf, and the last regiment proved really hard to find, but eventually the 19th Krieg Armoured were made available, though it was said they'd be late. In the end, the Brimlock Dragoons and the Krieg wouldn't arrive in time. They never saw action on Taros. Anyway, in theory, these units were split into two corps. Henth Corps, the Talans, who would undertake the initial assault and form the bulk of the main battle line, and 11th Corps, basically the rest, who would act as specialists and reserves. The invasion was also supported by other Imperial forces, a strike force of Space Marines from the Raptors, and a small battle group of four Warhounds from the Legio Ignatum on Mars. The Tech Priests of Stygis had pulled strings to keep their promise, as their own Titan Legions were already fully committed. The invasion plan would have three key objectives. First, to take a spaceport, and conveniently the only one was in Tarakeen, so take Tarakeen. Second, to deploy a sizable force immediately to secure a bridgehead, at least three regiments worth to the surface. And lastly, but most importantly, to secure a water supply to get the army through the desert. 
However, Tarrakeen and its surrounds were the most heavily defended areas of the planet from an orbital assault, so the plan was modified somewhat. Create a landing site outside the city to the south, ship down water and supplies, and then land so many forces here that they could overwhelm the thinly spread defenders and push on into Tarrakeen from the ground. At 232998M41, the Taros invasion fleet officially came into existence under the command of Fleet Admiral Cotto, who raised his flag on board the Overlord class battlecruiser Righteous Power. The six ships of the line, their escort squadrons, and the troop transports began assembling. As the fleet readied though, only 10th Corps was present. The regiments of 11th Corps would follow behind as a second wave after the fleet had fought its way in system, launch the invasion forces, and establish the secure deployment area on the surface. After three weeks travel, the fleet pulled out of the warp outside Taros. They met no resistance. It was clear that there was no Tau fleet presence yet. The Raptors battle barge War Talon pulled ahead. The Raptors had pledged 3rd and 6th companies to the war effort. 3rd company would be first in on the ground, conducting a surgical strike and taking out Missile Silo Decima, the only planetary defense silo south enough to target the Imperial landing. As the last of those missile silos were destroyed, more Raptor Thunderhawks landed and 6th Company secured the landing site as the invasion fleet's transports moved into position. Over the next two weeks, the first three regiments were landed and a secure beachhead created, Labor Corps deployed and air bases built for Imperial Navy Thunderbolts and Lightnings, and a sandbag perimeter set and manned all in the desert south of Tarrakeen, all without taking enemy fire. There was movement detected in the desert, but Tau forces aren't seen. In theory, this was a perfect deployment. The Raptors left the surface and moved back to their battle barge as the rest of 10th Corps deployed to the landing base, and the initial wave was readied on the ground while Distale drew up his attack plans. Tarakeen was situated on the Irakunda Isthmus, a strip of land between Taros's two major seas. The east end of the Isthmus was way too narrow for a ground assault. The Imperial forces would be bottlenecked, so the attack had to come from the west, but a diversionary force was needed to feint towards the east and draw off Tau forces. Originally, this was offered to the Raptors, but the Raptors' captain Aurelius declined, refusing to waste his marines on a diversion, and the job fell to the completely green 331st Talon Regiment. While they moved into position in the east, the rest of 10th Corps would begin a 60-day march across the desert, supported by the 3rd Talarn Armoured to surround Tarakeen, 1,200 kilometers away. As they moved out, 11th Corps will deploy to the landing zone, ready to either support the push if it got bogged down, or commit to the assault once it surrounded Tarakeen. After a rolling barrage of the immediate terrain outside the landing zone, the assault began, and encountered nothing. But the town commander on Taros, Chasso Ramir, or Commander Longknife, had prepared his hunter carjas well. They'd concealed themselves in the desert and had been observing Imperial Guard deployments for days, waiting for exactly the right time to strike. It was finally judged the time had come on the second day of the Imperial Offensive. The Imperial Guard infantry and tanks had left their perimeter defenses and were now in the open. Attacks should be kept swift, keeping the enemy at a distance. They needed to inflict casualties, then withdraw back into the desert. Hopefully the Imperials would pursue. The next day, they would be hit again. Firefights broke out all along the advance. The initial attack at the old mining base of Tungusta Station, where the Talan 17th were forced to retreat after their commander was killed by sniper fire, and the Tau brought in air support in the form of Barracuda flyers. Along the line, Tau railgun fire would disable Chimeras and destroy Liman Russes, forcing the Talans to engage on foot, where the hunter carters would pin them down with pulse fire before withdrawing into the desert. The assault slowed. Over the following days, the Imperials deployed Thunderbolts and Lightning Fighters from their landing zone to try and counter the Tau's mobility, which led to increased deployments of Barracudas by the Tau, and the Taros Air War began, featured in Aeronautica Imperialis, with dogfights in the skies above the advance becoming commonplace. By 20 days into the march, the Imperials were 100 kilometers behind schedule and suffering water rationing and fuel shortages as supply lines became stretched. By 25 days in, the 17th Regiment on the flank were engaged in a guerrilla war with Kroot forces over the Fira Heights. Destale committed the 3rd Armoured to prop up the stalling advance, who pushed forward into the huge strip mine of Gaidamak. After a three-hour fight through the quarry, the Tau commander, having destroyed 11 vehicles, called in Orcas and Barracudas and retreated once again. But as these battles raged, the second phase of the Tau plan had begun. Orcas flew secret night raids behind the Imperial advance, dropping Pathfinder and stealth suit teams along with Tetra support to ambush the Imperial Trojan convoys with water and fuel and destroy any supply dumps. They easily overwhelmed the Talarn Roughrider and Sentinel squadrons left on patrol. 
As the front line pushed forward to within 50 kilometers of the objective, the supply lines felt the pressure. Chasso Ramir might not have enough hunter cadres to stop the offensive, but the Imperial Guard was slowly running out of momentum due to its own logistical needs. By 640998, the offensive had ground to a halt. The 3rd Armoured had almost reached the Isthmus, but the infantry had been bogged down in the desert and heights, and the feint by the 331st had been completely ignored. The Tau raiding forces switched targets to the Imperial forward air bases, robbing the assault of air support. A logistical crisis was stalling the assault, and with water supplies running low, morale was dropping. And this supply issue was only exacerbated by events in orbit. Though the Righteous Power and its escorts had initially found the system deserted, much like on the planet, the Tau fleet had crept into position without being detected. Over the previous weeks, the Tau forces, led by the Custodian-class cruiser the R. Ro, had conducted a series of raids and attacks on the Imperial fleet, reducing its strength and destroying supply and reinforcement convoys, including the ships transporting the 8th Brimlock Dragoons. They'd never make it to the surface. Though Fleet Admiral Cotto was eventually able to track down and destroy the RO, the Imperial forces were at that point so reduced that the Tau could effectively block any further supplies from reaching the invasion force. Something needed to be done on the surface, and quickly. General Sikava of the Elysians proposed a new plan, Operation Comet. The Elysians would divert and lead a drop assault to capture Hydro Plant 2330 on the north of the Iracunda Isthmus. They'd then hold this as reserve forces from the Raptors and Legio Ignatum forced a breakthrough onto the Isthmus, allowing the main army to be resupplied with water from the plant and push on to Tarakeen. 160 Valkyries and 30 Vultures lifted off carrying the first assault wave. The first drop troops were cut down by Tau drones and recruit reinforcements backed up by flights of Tiger Sharps dropping wave after wave of drones. But as the bulk of the Elysian forces landed, they managed to push through and capture the plant by the end of the first day. The aircraft returned to base that night and the following morning the second wave were deployed, but the element of surprise had been lost and the air train was engaged by huge numbers of Barracudas and Tiger Sharks. The second drop suffered heavy casualties. Sikava himself was wounded after landing, and any Imperial Thunderbolt support was completely eliminated. Again, with total air superiority, the Tau started a long-range bombardment of the site before moving in with Hunter Cadres and Mantas. After three days of fighting in the ruins of the Hydra plant, the Tau commander requested a ceasefire, but the Elysians refused to surrender. All but annihilated, the wounded survivors of the regiment, including Sakava, were disarmed and loaded aboard the Mantas to take to Tau POW camps. Operation Comet was defeated. In the meantime, the breakthrough mission led by the Raptors and Warhounds had been a great success, pushing those 50 kilometers into the Isthmus in a day of fighting, though the Warhounds were forced to fall back when one of their number was destroyed outright by a new Tau weapon, the Titan-killing Tiger Shark AX-10. Nevertheless, the breakthrough allowed Colonel Snake Stransky and his 114th Cadian to push north towards the hydro plant, being harried along the way by more hit-and-run tower attacks. At the end of the push, the Cadian 114th arrived just four hours after the battle. Any survivors had already been taken by the Tau, and the hydro plant was a smouldering ruin. The failure of Operation Comet sent shockwaves through high command. Commissar General Van Horik, the lead commissar on the entire campaign, insisted that failure could not be tolerated, and de Stael was given the option of facing trial or personally leading an assault against the Tau from which he should not return. Purging much of the top brass, Van Horik attempted to salvage the situation. Regimental commanders were given license to withdraw towards the landing zone to shore up the supply lines until more supplies could be dropped in from orbit. But Van Horik was about to be handed a chance to end the campaign completely. General Sikava had been captured by the Tau during Operation Comet, and as a high-ranking officer, he was brought before Ramir in his command center. The Tau commander attempted to reason. The Imperials were defeated. There was no way they could win. Would the general not act as embassy for the Tau to convince the Imperials to retreat? The Tau were willing to cease fire to allow the Imperial forces to withdraw, and they'd also throw in the traitor Lord Orlis to sweeten the deal. Surely this was the best solution for everyone. Sikava flatly refused, stating that the Imperial Guard would fight the Tau every step of the way. He was returned to general confinement with his men, but Sikava had been observant in his confinement. As a general, he already had access to detailed information about the terrain, and through his interrogation, he'd managed to put together a reasonable estimate of his location. That evening, he staged an escape, overpowering the human guards and escaping into the desert with a small group. Three days later, his guess proved accurate as he was picked up outside Talan lines. 
the Imperials now knew the location of the Tau Command Center. Commissar Van Horik wasted no time, assembling a strike force under the command of the campaign's head of intelligence, Colonel Shager, and requesting aid from the Officio Assassinorum. Operation Death Blow would be a decapitation strike, take out Longknife and capitalize on the disruption. An Eversor assassin would deploy into the desert and head to the compound, while a crack stormtrooper team led by Shager himself would stage a diversionary attack on the perimeter of the command center to drive away Tau forces. On 684998, the transport Son of Duca avoided the Tau blockade and delivered its payload of supplies along with an Assassinorum drop casket containing a single Eversor assassin. After being loaded with mission information, the casket was deployed around 60 kilometers from the command center and the Eversor started his advance. As night fell, the three Valkyries flew low over the desert, eventually tripping the Tau security systems and deploying into a furious battle. As the Tau deployed to meet the threat, the Eversor reached the central command bunker and melter bombed its way through the door, only to find two bodyguards and a robed member of the ethereal cast, Orn Vray. Before it had a chance to search for Longknife, more bodyguards burst into the room and started riddling the assassin with pulse fire, even as it sprang into the assault. Many of the bodyguards fell to needle fire or the Eversor's neuro gauntlet before the assassin's self-destruct system kicked in and the operative and the bunker exploded in a ball of flame. Operation Deathblow had been a suicidal mission and it had almost worked. The ethereal Ornvray was dead, but Chasseau Ramir had survived. When the Eversus struck, he'd already been outside, personally leading his bodyguard against the stormtroopers. The stormtroopers themselves died to a man, but it wasn't the failure of this mission per se that ended the Imperial effort, but the Tau's response to it. The loss of the precious ethereal sent the entire Taros coalition force into shock and grief. For many days, the hunter carters were struck into inactivity by the loss. After the grief came a growing feeling of rage against the warriors who plotted this heinous attack. It was an anger that swelled inside each Tau warrior into a vengeful wrath. There could be no mercy now, only vengeance. The new Tau battle cry was no longer for the greater good, but for Orn Vray. For the first time in the conflict, the Tau abandoned all attempts at containment and went fully on the attack, just as the Imperial forces were trying to withdraw to mend their supply lines in the desert. With the new Tau offensive, this withdrawal quickly became a rout. The desert became a dumping ground as guardsmen abandoned their vehicles and equipment. Long columns of marching men tramped south, searching for forgotten water tanks or abandoned supplies. The Imperial expedition just fell apart. Lord Commander Gustavus ordered the full evacuation of all Imperial Guard units from the surface on 718-998-M41. As the long lines of troopers arrived at the landing zone for evacuation, the Raptors, one of the only formations still functional, deployed into the same sandbags laid at the start of the campaign to try and defend the landing zones. At 769, the Tau started a huge assault on the landing fields, held back for hours by the Raptors as the Imperial forces tried to escape. By the end of the day, with the initial assault spent, the Raptors boarded their own Thunderhawks and returned to orbit. The entire deployment had lasted only a few months, but the Taros campaign had cost the Imperium dearly. Five regiments completely destroyed, hundreds of vehicles, two cruisers, eight escorts, and one Legio Ignatum Titan had been lost. Over the next few years, the Tau cemented their hold on their new world of Taros. Ships from Tau and Dalith arrived on world, loaded with Tau colonists, and the world was fully brought into the Empire. To win it back, the Imperium would need to commit a far larger force, and with the 13th Black Crusade beginning, that simply wasn't possible. Taros would remain a Tau world for the foreseeable future. So there we are. I think the Taros campaign is a really good example of a small conflict in the Imperium. It gives a great illustration of why this massive, super powerful empire is failing. Partly it's misguided reasons, but also because it just has too much to do at any one time. Beset by the need to solve the Taros situation quickly, it could barely find enough units to complete the mission, and blundered in without proper preparation or any real respect for what the Tau would be able to do eventually losing because its own crazy desert assault was outmaneuvered at every turn. It also recalls real-world battles that 40k doesn't usually reference. At some points, the tank battles in the desert are reminiscent of World War II, but at other times the special forces raids and terms like the Taros Coalition reference the very real desert conflicts happening at the time this story was written. It's an interestingly modern feel for a 40k book. Anyway, it's not available to buy anymore, but if you have a Warhammer Plus subscription, you can read it in the vault. I've only really given the barest overview of it here, and the books go into great detail about all the individual battles I've mentioned. It's really worth a read. Anyway, thanks for watching.
If you'd like more content about the background of 40K, well, click on that box to the right there. It's probably pretty good. Or do the usual YouTube things involving bells and smashing buttons and stuff. See you next time.